Wow. It is great to be home. Great to be back. Ruthie and I are uh, getting to that age where winter is no fun anymore. When you stop playing in it, it's no fun anymore. I'll tell you where I'm at. I actually broke down about a snowblower. That's, that's where it's at. So I'm officially old. And uh, we were saying, you know, we have kids. We're still in St. Thomas, Ontario. Our, our two girls and, and uh, their husbands and their kids are in St. Thomas. Our home church is still there. But we've tossed around the idea of maybe one day moving, maybe when the grandkids get a little older and, you know, they get to be 10, 11, and 12, and they don't like you anymore. And um, they have other interests, you know, they have cars and girls and guys and all that, and you're out of money, so they don't love you anymore, you know, stuff like that. We thought about moving, and I said, where would you want to go? And we both almost said at the same time, we'd love to move back to Cleveland Baptist sometime. We love this church. We love coming back here. We have so many friends and families here, so many memories here. I served on the staff here for four and a half years. It was really four and a half of the greatest years of my life. I, I so enjoyed being here and, and working with the staff we had. Brother Kevin's here today. I really feel like you should be preaching here today, uh, but I'm better. So they had me. So, um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's not true, and you know it. <laughs> the staff you have now is a great staff. They get together and work together so well. There's a great camaraderie. We had a great staff when I was here, uh, other than Jack Beaver. Other than that, it was a great staff. <laughs> We loved, I love my time with Brother Jack Reed, great people. And, and I'll tell you one quick story. Brother Kevin was a great worker here. He was the assistant pastor and being groomed to be associate pastor. And Brother Dan Wolven and I worked together. And you know Brother Wolven. He's evil. And um, great guy. I love Brother Dan. We're great friends. We do a podcast together that you ought to be listening to called Tim Talks. T-I-I-M Talks. We talk about the Cleveland Baptist Church almost every week. Some of the stories or some of the people or what we learned and just an opportunity to relive some of those days. Tim Talks. And uh, we were talking the other day about one of the, the things we did. Brother Kevin worked in an office right next to us. And you know, Brother Kevin, he's, he's a worker. His dad was a worker. He was, he was pretty much business, and we did a lot of goofing around, but he was, he was the worker here. He did the work. We got all the praise and glory. And um, so he's in his office, and Brother Dan said, hey, let's get Kevin. Let's, let's do something to him. And I said, what do you want to do? He goes, I'm going to take something out of his office every day. And so I said, okay, I'm in. I'm in on it. So we'd go in, and Dan would take the stapler off Brother Kevin's desk, and he'd put it in his office. And the next day, we'd go in, and we'd get, you know, a few books off of his shelves. This went on for a couple of months, to, to the point where there was nothing left in his office but, a, but a, a coat rack and a few things on his desk. He never noticed. Never noticed one time. He'd look for a stapler, and he'd, just, he'd come out in the office and get a stapler, and usually he never even thought about it. He's just so dedicated to his work. And finally he came in, he had a trench coat on, he came in one day, took his trench coat, wanted to hang it up on the, the, the coat rack, and it fell to the floor, and he goes, hey, where's my coat rack? <laughs> never missed another thing. He came into our office, Dan and I shared an office, he came, we could hardly move in there, all his stuff is in there, so we're unmerciful to him, but uh, praise the Lord, we had some great times, man. Uh, this staff now works. We just goofed off. That's all we did, and uh, we had a great time doing it. But now we worked hard, and I worked in the bus ministry. I, I taught out in the school. Brother Pete and Sandra were uh, some of my students. Uh, this year, uh, we'll start our 40th year in the ministry, Ruthie and I, 40 years in the ministry. And uh, we have enjoyed every bit of it because of the foundation that I got here. I learned here that you could work hard and still have a great time. You could work hard and see God bless, and you could see a church rally around that, and we really did, and those were some great days. So thank you for that very, very much. And then we, we, we thank you so much for your support of the Canadian Gospel Project. The first, about two million uh, John Romans were hand-delivered. And our country, the second largest landmass in the world, about 300 independent Baptist churches for the entire nation. The average size of those churches is about 60 people. And so we asked those churches to help us and to do their areas, their city, maybe the county, and they hand-delivered those. And we can do that in Canada. You can put stuff in the mailbox as a church. And so we did that. And then we got to the point where we realized we were never going to see our entire nation unless we did something different. And so we contacted our post office, and they were very helpful and still are very helpful. In fact, they just gave us a, a notice the other day. Our, our numbers have dropped a little bit because we're coming to the end and taking a little bit longer. 
And they said, listen, we're going to keep the rate that we're charging you right now for the next couple of years. You don't have to worry about making any certain number. You've been a great customer of ours, 10 and a half million pieces. And uh, so we started mailing. And we have mailed to every region of Canada so far, except two, Quebec and New Brunswick, our two bilingual provinces. And uh, so they'll be done in English and French, and we will have finished our nation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by the support of churches like this, we've been able to do it. And then we're setting our goals on helping and reaching America with the gospel. You have far more churches, you have far more uh, financial assistance through the churches to be able to do that. And I'm hoping, I, I wanted to finish Canada by my uh, retirement age of 65. We're going to, I believe, be able to do that. And uh, I never thought, but I, and in my lifetime, potentially, we could see all of, of Canada and the United States covered with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I ask that you'll pray with us about that and help us with that. And then I want to encourage you, in 2024, we had scheduled a trip with the church to go to Israel, and because of COVID, we had to, we had to cancel that trip. And uh, we've waited to 2024. We want to we want to get 23 out of the way. All of the all of the stuff. I'm from a little country called Canada. We've had a little problem up there with COVID. I don't know if you've heard about it. Uh, some truckers, you know, things like that. Preachers being arrested. You know, just a few things to take care of. That's all subsided now. The border is open now. And uh, the only problem is that the U.S. border has not opened to Canada to those who are unvaccinated. This socialistic government that you've got, unbelievable. Um, uh, unbelievable. We can't get across for those that are unvaccinated. So we're going to wait till 24. Everything should be done out of the way. And we're going to take a trip back. If you signed up before, we want you to come with us. I, I'm telling you, it will change your life forever if you will go and see those places that we speak of in the Bible. You'll hear it. You'll taste it. You'll touch it. And it'll change your life. If you go to alstone.ca for Canada... All the information is there. The pastor will get some information here in the next few weeks. Brother Tom will help us and put that together. And uh, I would love to take a great number of you to Israel with us so that you can see that and be a part of that and uh, join along with us. I was thinking, uh, you know, today we, I came for men's prayer, had a great time. And I was thinking that for years in this ministry, really, from the beginning, uh, the Folgers were part of the foundation of the church, your grandparents, and then your dad was on staff, and then you were pastor, and, and, and now uh, Brother Pete is pastor. So there's a long line of succession here. And then I, I had prayer time and breakfast with Toby this morning. Dear God, please, please help. <laughs> Toby is a great young man. I said to Toby today, I said, Toby, what do you want to be when you grow up? He said, I don't know. I said, Toby, I'm going to start praying that you'd be the pastor here someday. Wouldn't that be great to carry that on? And uh, he, uh, he yesterday went out with his grandpa, and I, I think grandma was there too. They went to McDonald's, and he called his dad while we were down in Amish country, and he said, Dad, I ate, I ate 18 chicken McNuggets, 18 chicken McNuggets today. <laughs> And so he came in this morning, and he didn't, he didn't recognize me, didn't know me. He goes, hey, Dad, who's that guy? He goes, that's the guy from Tim Talks that does the big slurp when he introduces the program. And I said, I'll tell you who I am. I'm, I'm the guy that can eat 20 McNuggets. He said, I could too if I had them. So that's Toby, and he's falling into the line of succession here, so he pray for him. Genesis chapter 2 this morning. Genesis chapter 2. Let me ask you this morning, do you see the soul? Do you see the soul? Let me be completely transparent with you. We have some visitors here today. I met two uh, lovely young ladies. They're here from Germany today. And uh, guten Tag to them. Guten, guten Nagen. Good, uh, that's good night. Guten Morgen. Uh, good morning is uh, German. We have some German folks in our area. And they're visiting. And, and I want to let them know a little bit about who I am and who you are and who our countries are. I was raised in a Christian home. My parents were saved as teenagers. They got away from the Lord as they got a little bit older in life in those uh, later teen years, as a lot of young people do. And they started to partake of the activities of this world, things that were not the Christian life. My mom and dad got married, and when they did, they realized from their Christian training that they ought to be raising their kids in the Lord. And so when I was born, they went back to church for a short time. My sister and I were born just uh, 13 months apart, and so they took us to church, and they did a dedication service. They dedicated us to be raised in the things of the Lord, and my mom and dad did that for a little bit, and then they got away from the Lord again. And I was uh, about five, six years of age, and my uncle, who was a godly man, a deacon at the church that I grew up in, said to my mom and dad, would it be okay if I took the kids to church? 
And my mom and dad said, yeah, that'd be fine. You can do that. And so for years, he picked us up Sunday mornings, and he took us to Sunday school. And my dad would pick us up after the service. He'd go play hockey on Sunday mornings in the wintertime. And one uh, Sunday morning in the winter, he uh, came to pick us up, and he was sitting in his truck outside the church, and he saw people coming out of the church. And God began to break his heart, began to really burden him that he had promised God that he would raise us in the things of the Lord and realize he wasn't doing it. And he said, God spoke to him and said, you know, I have every right to take you from this world because you made a promise and did not keep it. You vowed to me. And my dad got scared. My dad said, God, you're right. And so we got in the truck that morning. My dad said, hey, how would you like how would you guys like to go to Sunday school uh, and church together as a family every week with, with me and mom? And I, we said, that'd be great. We'd love that. And so they started back to church and never missed from that time forward. Amen. And raised us in the things of the Lord. I grew up in a very fundamental Baptist church. Many of you remember Dr. Harry Strachan. Dr. Strachan was my pastor. He led me to the Lord when I was nine years of age. I loved him. He and Dr. Thompson had the, the greatest spiritual impact in my lives. One led me to Christ. One taught me how to uh, serve in the ministry of Jesus Christ. And I, I remember uh, some of the, the last memories I have of those men. My father-in-law had cancer, and Dr. Strachan had cancer as well, and he was in hospice, and it was, he, was, he was dying. We knew he was getting ready to go, and, and uh, it was a Christmas. And my father-in-law said, hey, let's, let's go visit. I always loved to visit people that were in hospital or, or, or in service, the fire department, someone on a Christmas morning. And, and so he said, would you go with me? And I said, I'd love to go with you. And so he said, let's go see Brother Strachan. And I said, I'd love to. And so we went, and, and I'm in a room with Dr. Strachan, who led me to Christ. I'm in the room with, my, with the man who mentored me and trained me and loved me, my father-in-law. And, and we're talking, and I walked in, and I, I said, Dr. Strachan, I said, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but I want to tell you that I love you. And I am so thankful that you led me to Christ. I said, I will never forget the day as a nine-year-old boy when I knelt beside my grandma's couch. My grandma and I trusted Christ as Savior. I'll never forget that. I said, Dr. Thompson, Dad, I said, I will never forget when I came on the staff of the Cleveland Baptist Church and you took a young kid and took a great chance and allowed me to come and work here and marry your daughter. I said, I will never forget that. I'll never forget the training that you've given to me. And my father-in-law said, Al, why don't you pray for us? And I was so taken. I thought, I'm with Moses and Elijah. <laughs> how could I, Dr. Dr. Strachan and Dr. Roy Thomas, how could I pray for those guys? And so I prayed, and I wept through most of it. And I said, God, thank you for these men. Aren't you glad we've had men in the ministry of Jesus Christ who have taken a strong stand and, and chose the right side of every, every issue and here today sounds a testament of men, Dr. Thompson, Brother Folger, now Brother Folger again, men who said, you know what, we don't care about society, what society thinks. We don't care about the, the public opinion. We are going to preach the word of God. Amen. We're going to stand by the word of God. Fundamental Baptist churches, that's who we are. I live in a very conservative part of Canada. You may think that all of Canada is liberal. It's not. Our city centers, like here in the United States, are very liberal. Toronto, our largest city, the fourth largest city in North America. Toronto, over 8 million people, very liberal, very liberal. I live in a very conservative area of Canada. I grew up singing the national anthem and reciting the Lord's Prayer in school as a kid. I received a worksheet in grade two that, that had a, a family that the father was in a suit and the mother was in a dress and the little boy had a suit on and the little girl had a dress on. They were walking towards a building and it said, what is this family doing? And the answer was, they're going to church. And the next question was, in a public school just over 40 years ago, 50 years ago, does your family do this? On the other side, the family sitting at the table, their hands are folded. The question is, what are they doing? And the answer is... The next question, does your family do this? Could you imagine a public school teacher today passing out that paper in a public school and asking those questions? You know there would be outrage, there would be a, they'd be suspended or fired. People would be uproared because people asking that question. We sang the national anthem. I started out singing God Save the Queen. People have asked me, are you saddened by the passing of the queen? I, I kind of am. She, she was our monarch. She was a figurehead for us. She didn't have much control over Canada, but, but she was a representative of our nation and represented our nation. And, and so when she passed away, I, I got a little choked up, I'll be honest, because I sang God Save the Queen. 
Send her victorious, happy and glorious, long to reign over us. God save the queen. And then we recited the Lord's Prayer every day in our school. I don't think they're reciting the Lord's Prayer in school anymore, are they? I don't think they're talking about Jesus in school. I don't think they're talking about Jesus in our, in our public places. I, I don't pe think people are so accepting of those things. I know I live in a cancel culture with woke businesses and governments and schools. I'm confronted continually with the LGBTQ and add all the other letters to that. The transgender movement of this day. The binary, we don't know what we are. We don't know if we're a man or a woman, what we should be. People are confused on that. And who knows what next ideals will come along. I see my country of Canada slipping farther and farther away from what it once was morally. I'm, I'm going to go back to the old days for just a moment if I could because those were great days. And I think there's some great days ahead. I think young people that are here today, I don't want to discourage you. I don't want you to think that it's hopeless. It's up to you. It's going to be up to you. But would you please do this? Would you go sometime this week and talk to your grandparents and say, tell me about the day in which you lived? Tell me about that. Tell me about when dad came home and you sat at the table and you had supper together and you actually communicated with each other and the kids played and dad played with the kids a little bit before they went to bed and, and mom got them ready and bathed them and, and got them into bed and you read the Bible story, the big white Bible story book. We all had one. And, and, and you went outside. I was a kid when I went outside. Listen, you didn't want to be inside. Saturday morning only. Saturday morning only because cartoons were on Saturday morning. Bugs Bunny, the Roadrunner. Remember when cartoons were cartoons? There wasn't any hidden agenda in there. Listen, Wiley Coyote just wanted to eat a Roadrunner. <laughs> Never could. Love it. We didn't have all this nonsense stuff. Man, when I was a kid, my mom said, hey, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's Monday after school. It's, it's 4 o'clock. Go out and play. And we played. The rule was you had to be home when the... When the street lights came on, remember that? We'd run all over the neighborhood, got our bikes. We were all, I had a town of 8,000 people. So it was pretty, pretty small, pretty safe, you know? My mom, when I was a kid, took, took my sister and I, pushed us in a baby buggy to downtown Simcoe. And we had a Woolworths store there. Remember Woolworths? How many of you remember Woolworths? You are old. <laughs> you really, like, you're antique. Woolworths. She would take our buggy and push it to Woolworths and put it in line with about 20 other buggies and would go inside the store and shop the kids in the buggies. I'd be in that buggy. Hey, Pete, Mary, how are we? I was just a baby. You left the baby in a buggy outside of a store. You could. You could. Remember when you went to church together as a family? Like every Sunday? Very few in our town did not go. It wasn't always to the Fundamental Baptist Church, but they went to some church. They heard something of morality there, something of the Bible, and people were decent and kind, and it was just a different day. We don't have that so much today. I see our country slipping farther and farther away spiritually. Wow, it's, it's sad to say that in Canada, the growing religion, the number one growing religion in Canada is atheism. People just don't believe it's not Catholicism, it's not Islam, it's not those other things. It's, it's people just saying, we don't believe there's a God. I see us drifting away politically. Politics is a hot issue, and I'm not going to debate that today, but it just seemed like in that day, even those parties that we thought were not what we were still seemed to have a desire to have something of morality and decency, and it really was the care of the people that they were concerned about. We see that changing I was raised to take a strong stand against those things that were wrong that I saw. If it didn't line up with the Bible, we took a stand against it. My preacher preached against it. And there's been criticism over the last number of years that some of those preachers were maybe too hard. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I think those preachers, I think Dr. Thompson, and, and you saw and I saw, he preached against things. And sometimes we thought, why is he so hard on those things? Why was Dr. Stragon so hard on those things? I'll tell you why. I think they saw this day coming. I, I think they saw it, and they were trying to prepare us, and they were trying to hold back society from going in that direction, and we know that that's almost an impossible thing to do, but they were trying to keep as many as they could from entering into where we are at today. Our world is in trouble. 
Our world's messed up. We have more people committing suicide now than we have ever seen in the histories of our country. Young people are taking their lives. This church is no stranger to that. We see people that are addicted to drugs and alcohol and pornography and gambling and all those things. Why? Because there's something missing in their lives. I believe a large portion of those who are messed up on this whole gender identity and all this, I think the problem is they, they weren't born that way. There's something missing in their lives and they're trying to find something to fill the void of their lives and they find people that, 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 that share in that same kind of interest and they want to be a part of something. They want to be a part of a group that loves them. Now I want you to know that as churches, we've been tagged as haters. We've been tagged of, uh, uh, as those who, who, who despise those who are different than we are. But I want you to know that's not the truth. At least of this church and the churches that I'm in, that's not the truth at all. Maybe today you come with that preconceived notion that we just hate people and, and everybody's got to be just like us. No, that's not the truth at all. We love people. We care for people. We want to help people. I want you to know this morning that because of the changes in our society, I'm confused. I'm confused. I don't get it. I just don't get it. I meet people and they tell me their stories and where they're at and I'm just, I'm confused because I had such a good life growing up. And I saw great things happen of the Lord and I, and, and I saw countries that seemed to be productive not only physically, politically, but also spiritually and we're missing some of that today. I'm frustrated. I'm 60, uh, 59 years, just turned 59 years of age. Amen. And I'm getting to that age where, you know, as you get older, you, you wonder about the next generation. And, and we appear to be cranky sometimes, and we appear, appear to be harsh sometimes, but it's because we love them so much. My kids are next. My grandkids are next. How many of you have grandkids today? Aren't they awesome? Yeah, everybody tries to prepare you for grandkids, but you just cannot understand grandkids. We have a young lady over here. She's, you're the granddaughter. She's, she's like, yes. You're, you're sitting over here. Don't, don't shrink down. Is that grandpa and grandma next to you? Is that grandpa and grandma? Listen, grandpa and grandma, you love, you love your daughter, don't you? But you love your granddaughter just a little bit more. <laughs> right? That kid gets away with stuff you never got away with. She can eat what she wants, sleep where she wants, go where she wants, and all she has to do is look up at grandma. You call him grandpa? Is it grandpa? Does that work? What's, he, what's she call you? Papa, Papa, I love you. What do you want? What do you want? Get the wallet out. What do you want? <laughs> right? I'm Poppy. I wanted my kids to call me Big Poppy. I wanted the kids, grandkids to call me Big Poppy. <laughs> my daughter said, that sounds like a gangster. You're not, you're not going to be Big Poppy. <laughs> they call me Poppy. My grandson calls me <laughs> Poopy Poppy. But that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Ruthie is my sweet Nana, and I'm Poopy Poppy. I love it. Those grandkids, your, your grandchildren, are God's gift to you for not killing your children. That's what it is, right? There were times you thought, I'm going to take her out of this world. Mom said, I brought her in. I'll take her out. She's got to sleep sometime. She's got to go sleep. My grandkids are in this generation. And they're growing up with drag queens going to schools and reading books to them, television programs about them. I can't believe everybody watching drag queens. These men who dress up as women and, and parade in, in these outlandish costumes. And that's okay. We, you should be accepting that. That's their choice. I get frustrated. I'm against that. I'm not for that. That's not the Bible. That's not what God ordained. That's not the, the, natural, the natural part of life. You say, do you hate those people? No. I feel sorry for them. Because I can tell there's something missing in their life. And I'm going to be honest. I'll be transparent. Sometimes I get angry. Sometimes I get upset with the freedoms that they have that seem to be slipping away from us. You try and have a prayer time in a public school. Probably not going to happen. Maybe after school, if you can find a teacher that'll sponsor it. But boy, you can have a club, you can have a meeting, you can pass out brochures, you can do whatever you want. There was a time when we went into the schools and we were able to uh, promote the things of Jesus Christ. Now that's, that's been taken away. Something that was wholesome and good and wanted to promote the good of family and country. Let me ask this morning, confused, frustrated, and angry. How many of you feel the same way sometimes? Yeah, I think we all do. My dilemma, 
our dilemma is that we are still commanded by Christ to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Whether we agree or not, every creature. Whether we accept it or not, every creature. Whether, whether or not it, it kind of turns us, every creature deserves to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ with love and compassion. Our dilemma, your dilemma, is that we're commanded by Christ to love all men as Christ did. Do you think Christ is maybe surprised when he's on the cross to find out that 2,000 years later that the actions of Sodom and Gomorrah would be active and prevalent in our society today? He wasn't surprised. God's never been surprised. He died for them. He loves them. That's somebody's child. That, that's somebody's grandchild. That, that's somebody who has an eternal life and a choice of which eternal life they will choose. My dilemma and your dilemma is commanded by Christ to somehow look beyond the fault and see the need of the lost. How in the world are we to do that? Well, the answer is we must see the soul. Would you say that with me? We must see the soul. We've got to see that. Looking beyond the flags and the operations and the effects of sin and the desire for it to see the soul of mankind. Look at the person next to you this morning. Look at the person next to you or around behind you. Look at, look at someone today. That's a soul. That's not just a body. That, that's not just a person. That's a soul created by Almighty God. God had a plan. God has a plan. God knows you. God cares for you. God sent his son to die on a cross to pay the penalty of the sins of your life. And I don't think any of us would argue today that all of us have sinned at some times in our life. We have disobeyed the word of God. We have disobeyed the command of God. We've disobeyed the laws of the land. We have sinned in our lives. And God sent his son to die on a cross, to die in humility, to die in great agony so that we might have a forgiveness of sin. And if we simply accept that, we can have the hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Aren't you glad God loved you? If God loves you, he has got to love those others. The abortionist. God hates what they do, but he loves them. Those that would do vile and wicked things that we would never even want to think about, he sent his son to die for them too. Amen. And sometimes as Christians, we don't hate and, and, and we don't despise, but, but we do struggle. I struggle to love them. I struggle to give them Christ because I'm so, so opposed to what they do sometimes. I'm so opposed to the message that they preach to, to the society that we're in and, and try to draw people into that and see those that follow. Looking beyond those things, we must see the soul of man. Look with me now, what I hope brings a restoration to a weakened attempt to win a world that is so different from us, it makes us hesitant to even share Christ with them. Let me ask you as we go to Genesis chapter 2, let me ask you this. When you see someone who's a drug addict or an alcoholic, a pornographer, somebody who partakes of pornography, gambling, LGBTQ, trans, binary, when, when you see them, do you hesitate to talk to them about Christ? Do you go out of your way to maybe not make contact with them? Do, do you maybe harbor in your heart some bitterness that, that keeps you from telling them of the things of Christ? The, the truth, my friends, is that every one of those that I just mentioned, and more, I don't have time to mention them all, but anybody who's contrary to what we believe, all of them need Christ. And who's going to tell them if we don't? Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became what? A living soul. It was just a body before God breathed into it. And what brought that body from just a body to life? The soul, the breath of God. The breath of God brings alive that body. This body that you see is alive because of the breath of God. We just found out we're going to have our fourth grandchild here uh, this year. We're so excited about that. 
And, and we've been watching. They have apps now that show you where that baby's at. Our, our baby right now is a prune, size of a prune. And, and just, just a few weeks, just a few weeks. And, and, I, and I found a thing the other day on the Internet, and it showed the progression of that, that baby. It's not an embryo. It's not, it's not a fetus. It's a baby in there. That's, that's a baby. If that baby's born, it'll be a human baby. All right, so that baby, and we see the progression, and man, it's so exciting. Because I can tell already, that baby looks a lot like me. <laughs> kind of prunish. With intellect and thought and emotion and love from God. The only way we know love in this society is because God is love. And he has put inside of us a little piece of him that we become like him, created in his image. We have a love. God sees the soul, we see the body. God sees the heart, we see the sin. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, the second part says, The Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. We do see the outside, and we do judge by the outside. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes growing up in, in, in our fundamental churches, we put a lot of emphasis on the outside. If, if a person looked right, if they had the right Bible, if they had the right haircut, if they had the right length of, of skirt, then they were a good Christian. Truth of the matter is, that wasn't true. That wasn't true. And we put a lot of emphasis on that. And, and, and sometimes, and I'll say it myself, sometimes I, I should have put way more emphasis on the Holy Spirit relationship of the soul. That this was right, the inside right, the soul was right. Because when the soul's right, the rest follows. If we ever hope to win the world that we're in, I'd say a messed up world, we must see the soul. We must first see that the soul is life. Would you go to Jeremiah chapter 1 with me? The soul is life. Jeremiah chapter 1. In verse 5. Watch this now. God's speaking to Jeremiah, but can speak to every one of us. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. I knew thee. I knew who you were going to be. I knew where you were going to go. I know what you're going to say. God knows all things. He's sovereign. He knows all things. He's omnipotent. He's, he, he's omniscient. He's all-knowing, all-powerful. He knows everything. He's God. He says, and I, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I set you apart. I had a plan for you, and I ordained thee, uh, uh, specifically of Jeremiah, that you'd be a prophet unto the nations. I believe when I, when I was in the thought of my parents and, and was formed in the belly of my mother, God knew that one day I'd be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I surrendered myself to that when I was 12 years of age. God, I surrender. I'm, I'm available. And I'd like every person in this room at one time in your life to say, God, I'm available to whatever you want. And God immediately told me, you're going to be a preacher. I went to school the next week, and the teacher had all the kids stand up and say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And firemen and policemen and doctor and nurse. And I said, I'm, I'm going to be a preacher. And the kid said, what's that? I said, I'm going to be a minister. I'm going to be somebody who preaches the Bible. And they were all kind of dumbfounded. The, the teacher was like, what? <laughs> that wasn't the norm. I had a great, great thing. I, I had a great uh, kindergarten teacher, and she promised all the kids that uh, at the end of the school year, everybody would get a hug from the teacher as we left. And so uh, the end of the day came. It ran a little bit late, and the teacher's going through the line, and she gets to about the, you know, the L's or M's. We had to do it alphabetically. She gets to the L's and M's. The bell rings. She said, I'm sorry, kids. We don't have time for everybody to get a hug. I was devastated. Fast forward about 50 years, and I said to my dad, I never got my hug. He goes, you know, she's still alive. I said, really? Is she good looking? And um, she's like 80 years old. <laughs> yeah, she's still alive. I said, really? She says, yeah, they got a family business. Why don't you get down there? So I, I went down and I said, this is going to sound really weird. <laughs> My name's Al Stone and I want to hug Mrs. Wicker. And they said, let us get her on the phone. I said, here's my card. I'm a preacher. I'm not some kind of sicko. Though that doesn't really help today. Uh, so I was like, 
And they said, let us call her. So she came. I said, don't tell her what's going on. Just ask her to come down. So she comes down, and I, she walked in, and she looked at me. She said, Alan Stone. I was like, yes. She goes, aren't you a preacher? I said, yes, I am. She said, in St. Thomas. I said, yeah. All those years, she kept track of what I was doing. I said, Mrs. Wicker, I never got my hug. She said, you come here, and she hugged me. I kissed her right on the lips. Oh, I was like, no. I did not. Sickos. She kissed me. All right, so. <laughs> you was right. Like, Ew. <laughs> then she spit, and then it was great. God knew. God knew. Go with me to Genesis 35. I'll give you just a couple scriptures here today. I want you to see this. Genesis 35, verses 17 and 18. For those of you that don't know me, I do like to kid around a little bit. <laughs> Too much. Genesis 35. Verse 17, And it came to pass when she was hard and labored that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died. That's death. When the soul leaves the body, that's death. We can keep bodies alive today. We have great technology to be able to do that. But when the, when the soul leaves the body, death, because the soul is life. You are here today because your soul is present within this body. That's why we hold so dearly the sanctity of life. That's why we want to protect the unborn because we believe that's life. That's why we want to protect our, our seniors because that's life. And God is the giver and the taker of life, God tells us. Not us. Every person you see and even don't see in utero is a soul, a life created in the image of God, and God counts that soul as very special to him. In fact, he tells us that the death of his saints are precious in his sight. This church has had hundreds, thousands of funerals over the years, and every person who leaves this world knowing Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, having accepted him as their Savior, leaves this world, and it's precious in the sight of God. I, I don't know what happens when we get to heaven. We have all kinds of speculation, don't we? I don't know who's going to meet us at the gate. I, I don't know if Peter's even standing there in guard. But I, I'm going to go there someday, and, and I, I, I'm going to see a sea of people, and I'm going to know a lot of them. I'm going to see my father-in-law, Dr. Roy Thompson. I'm going to see Dr. Strachan. I'm going to see my sweet grandparents that have gone, some uncles and aunts that have gone, some of my church members have gone. I don't know if they'll greet me or what, but I know this. At some point, I'm going through that crowd, and I'm going to say, I want to see Jesus. Amen. Maybe he meets us first. I don't know. But it's going to be awesome, precious. I, I, I envision in my mind, and I could be all wrong, and I think God gives us a little attitude, but I, I know that, that we're going to fall at the feet of the Savior in awe and in thankfulness. But I just think, maybe it's me, but I just think he's going to rise us up and embrace us Amen. and say, I'm glad you're home. I love you. This church taught me a great lesson. Lois Mosier, is Lois in here? Is she in Sunday school? Lois is right here. Lois Mosier and, and, and uh, ladies like her, her sidekick for how many years have you guys been sitting together? Long, long time. Ladies like this who came up from West Virginia, Kentucky. I was a kid from Canada. We're not a very emotional people. I'm not a typical Canadian. I'll tell you that right now. I was ruined by the Cleveland Baptist Church. Um, <laughs> at home, we'd have handshaking and hello, hello. At Cleveland Baptist Church, when I was, when I was a kid here, you know, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, those, those ladies from West Virginia, Kentucky, they, they, weren't, they weren't satisfied with just shaking your hand. Man, they hugged you. Hello, sweetie. Good to have you here today. I'd be like, hello. <laughs> I got where I liked it. And I'd hug them back. My mother-in-law taught me. She said, she said, good night, Steve Ted, I love you. I told the folks at the retreat this. She said, good night, Steve Ted, I love you. And I said, thank you. I went home and I tried it with my mom and dad after several months of living here. I went home and said, hey, mom and dad, Steve Ted, I love you. And my mom said, thank you. <laughs> I learned, man, that hugging, that loving, that, that's great. And I, I, I hug my kids and I embrace my grandkids. I just have to think that when I get to heaven, the Lord's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I'm glad you're here. And then we see this. The soul is not only life. The soul is lackadaisical. 
There's a period of our lives where our soul is just ignorant of what is right and wrong. For the first part, it's the age of unaccountability. There's no understanding, no reason. There are some folks that are born without the ability to reason in their lives. They've, they've suffered maybe something in birth, or they've been born that way that they can't grasp those things. They're innocent, the Bible tells us. But even as we grow older, there are times when an untrained soul just messes up because they just don't know better. Go, if you would, to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus. You're probably someone today, they don't have a Bible, share with them, or someone's visiting, they share with them. Leviticus chapter 5, over just a few books. And verse 15 says, If a soul committed trespass and sin through ignorance, through ignorance in the holy things of the Lord, then he shall bring for his trespass unto the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flocks, thy estimation by the shekels of silver, after the shekels of the sanctuary for a trespass offering. There are times when people are just ignorant, ignorant of sin. Can I tell you that we, we, with the advent of the theory of evolution, we have many in this world that are just ignorant as to who God is. They don't know. Evolution has become our greatest enemy of the gospel because we have a world today that doesn't believe there's a God. I used to start when I talked to people about Christ, I'd say, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. Today I start with, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. They're ignorant. I, I was up in Michigan and I was preaching a camp and, and they had several bus kids who came to that camp and a little girl, after I preached a message on who Jesus is and who God is, and I, I said that Jesus is God. He was there in creation. He had part and God oversaw and Jesus, what he did, the Holy Spirit was there and moved. I got all done and she walked up to me, 12 year old little girl. She said, hey, I want to tell you something, mister. There is no God. Whew. Kind of caught me off guard. She said, my dad says so. I thought, your dad's a foolish man, young lady. I didn't say it, but I thought. I said, I want to tell you something. There is a God, and I'm going to prove it to you this week. Man, it got, took till Thursday. She wouldn't talk to me. She wouldn't look at me when I was preaching. She was so upset. I was kind to her. I loved her. I said, I'm going to tell you there is a God. I believe there is a God. I'm going to show you there is a God. The Bible says there's a God. And finally, Thursday, she broke and listened to what I said and answered some questions. And I went to her, and I said, I want you to know I love you. And I want you to know that God loves you. And I want you to know that Jesus loves you. Those that think we are born wrong are ignorant. Those who have raised their whole lives to believe a lie, they are ignorant. And on the ignorant, we need to bestow God's mercy and grace, but not withholding the truth. And then we finally see very quickly, the soul is lucrative. Would you look at Mark chapter 8? Let's go to the New Testament. Mark chapter 8, I'll close here in just a minute. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 37. I want you to know today, those of you that are here, maybe your first time. Maybe you've never been in a church like this. Maybe you're visiting. Maybe you've just started coming. Maybe you've never heard these things. I want you to know today that God absolutely loves you. This church, I've traveled all over Canada, the United States. I've been to other parts of the world. This church is by far one of the most loving churches I have ever been a part of in all my time of ministry. This is a loving church. Somebody invited you here today because they love you. Somebody invited you here today and hoped that you would hear a message that would help you to understand why they believe what they believe. Let me show you this in Mark chapter eight, the value of your soul, the value of you to this church. In Mark chapter eight and verse 34, and when he called the people unto him with his disciples, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Now watch what he says. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I've met some very influential people in my life. I met uh, our... I've met uh, one prime minister twice, and the prime minister we have now, I've met him twice, not had long conversation, but had the opportunity to meet him. I met Mr. Ron Joyce, who was the co-founder of Tim Hortons, the greatest coffee company of all the world, <laughs> Canadian coffee company, huge. Met Mr. Joyce, $1.6 billion he was worth. $1.6 billion. 
I met him. I took him a Bible. I took him one of our John and Romans. I invited him to know Jesus Christ as his Savior. And he said, Pastor, I grew up in the church. My mother made me go to Sunday school. When I became a teenager, I got out and I started drinking. I've been an alcoholic my whole life. I've struggled. I don't think God wants anything to do with me. And I said, oh, Mr. Joyce, you are so wrong. He loves you. I said, Mr. Joyce, I looked it up. You're worth $1.6 billion. And I want you to know not one penny, not one penny of that is going to do you any good when you stand before God. You must come. Come to Jesus Christ and know him as your Savior, or you will perish for eternity, and your money will be squandered. Amen. Because the Bible says, what profit of the man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Let me ask you today, are you willing to gamble that? Are, are, are you throwing the dice on that today? <sighs> hey, eternity, let's, let's see what happens. Don't do that. God loves you. This church loves you. They want to give you the hope of eternal life. They want to give you peace and contentment. There is no profit, there is no gain if you own this world and lose your soul. I want you to catch as it says, lose his own soul. His own soul. You make the choice. The decision is yours. I can't force you. I can't make you. I can't bestow that upon you, nor do I want to, nor does this church. We simply want to tell you, this is what the Bible says. This is what God says. This is what's been preached to us. We have accepted it, and we are glad to tell you that we have received Christ as our Savior. Our life has been changed. We love the Lord. We're glad to come here, and we are living for Christ. If you love that today, say amen. amen. You're surrounded by people who have seen the value of the soul and have put the soul in the hands of Jesus Christ, that we one day will live eternally with him in a place where there are no hospitals, there are no funeral homes. There's no COVID. There's no heart attacks. There's no rape. There's no molesting children. There's no undecidedness of what gender I'll be. It's all about the peace and hope and love of God, and we'll live in his presence forever. So the next time you think you hear someone question the love of God, who is love about sending, uh, who is love about sending innocent uh, or good people to hell? That's, that's not on him. That's on those who see a greater profit in the things of this world. And if applicable, that's on you. When we see the soul of those around us, we need to see how lucrative that soul is. Precious in the sight of God. Precious in the sight of God. That they need to help of Jesus Christ. Precious in the sight of God that God brings the Bible to us. Precious in the sight of God that he gives us churches that will come and tell us the truth and not what we want to hear, but what we need to hear. Precious. Would you do this for me, church? Would you begin seeing those people in your life that you know that aren't saved and you've tried to talk to them and they've struggled and there's people at work who are different than you and they've chosen the lifestyles of this world. Would you see those people in your family? They're nice people, they're good people, but they're lost in the things of Christ. Would you see the soul today? And not just what's on the outside. And not just the activities that they're participating in. And not just the words they say, but would you see the soul that which God created, that which God loved, that which God gave his son for, the soul. We've got to stop seeing people and start seeing souls. We've got to stop seeing sinners and start seeing souls. We need to stop seeing depravity and start seeing souls. Souls confirmed to an eternity of a torment and anguish, not because God sent them there, but because they may have let them go unwarned. Would you beg God with me today that we might see souls? That person next to you is a soul. They may not be saved. That person that you'll go home to is a soul and they may not know Christ. Your kids, your grandkids, your neighbors, your friends, your workmates, your schoolmates, your team buddies. Would you this week see them as a soul? And would you begin begging God, even this morning, would you begin begging God, God, let me see them differently. Let me not have that reserve, not let me have that resentment, not let me have that anger that I've had. Let me see the soul. And let's see what God will do. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for this great church and for the privilege of being a part of it and now being a part again today. I'm so glad to be home. I'm so glad to be among friends. Father, if there's one person here today, a soul that has not yet received Christ as their Savior, may today be the day of salvation. 
We've seen in the history of this church people walk an aisle and trust Christ as their Savior. 20, 30 people come at a time and trust Christ. And we've seen weeks where one and two come. And we praise the Lord for every event when someone comes to know Christ. And maybe there are some here today who know someone, they have someone, and they're not sure they're saved. I pray that in this invitation time they would quietly ask, would you like to know Christ? Could I go with you? Because it's all new to them. And Father, I pray today that some of us would come and get on our face before you and say, God, I've neglected. I have purposely not told people. I've walked away from people. I have shunned people because they don't believe exactly as I do, but they need Christ, and I want to give that to them, empower me, embolden me to do that. Father, if there's one here that's not saved, that they might be saved, and for all of us that we might see the souls of those around us today, because that's how you see them. That's how you love them. That's how you call to them. Help us, I pray. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed this morning. Let's just take a moment of personal reflection. Let me ask you today, do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? Do you remember that day as I do when I was a nine-year-old boy? You may be nine, 19, 99. It doesn't matter what age, but there's a time in your life when you called and said, Jesus Christ, I am a sinner. I need a Savior. I believe that you're that Savior, and I trust, with, I trust my whole heart with you. I give my life to you, Jesus. I'm saved. How many of you say that this morning by a raised hand? I am born again. I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. Raise your hand high in the air, high in the air. Oh, man, what a great sight. 99.9% .9 of the people here on this main floor in the balcony said, that's my testimony, I'm saved. But there are some here today that did not raise their hand. I saw a few didn't raise their hands. I wondered today if you would allow someone to take a Bible and show you how to be saved so you could have the hope of eternal life. God loves you that much. He brought you to this place today to hear that message, to let you know that somebody cares enough they want to tell you about Christ. Is there one here today saying, I'm not saved? I'm not saved. I'd like to be. Would you slip your hand up and hold it for just a moment? I see it. God bless you. Back in the back there, I see you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you, young man. God bless you. Is there someone else? I'm not saved. I don't know Christ. I'd like to. Amen. Back here. Amen. God bless you. The center section there. God bless you. Over here on this side, my left side. God bless you. Thank you for that. Are there others? I'm not saved. I'm not saved. Young man right here in the back. God bless you. I see you. Thank you, buddy. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do today. When we stand in a moment and we begin to sing, I'm going to ask those that aren't saved, would you come and let someone take a Bible and try to get saved? You say, preacher, that's a long way down on the aisle. I promise you this. You make the first step. You kind of float the rest of the way. There are people here that will come with you. There's going to be some that's going to ask you, would you like to go? They're, they're going to help you because you're not sure what to do. They'll help you today. Even if you didn't raise your hand, when you see those other come, you feel moved of the Holy Spirit of God. You step out and come. Step out of that aisle. Someone will help you. I'll come down and meet you. Come. How many today say, preacher, you touched a nerve with me today. And there's some people that I need to talk to that I've avoided. There's some people I've been afraid of because I just don't know what they are or what they do. And I see people differently today, and I've got some people I need to pray for. Would you slip your hand up and hold it for just a moment and say, that's me, that's me. God bless you, amen. So the rest of you are making every attempt to win those people to Christ. You're, you're taking every effort to step out and say, listen, I don't care what your preferences are, I don't care what your, what your views are, I've just gotta tell you about Christ. If that's what you're doing, God bless you, I'm, I'm ready for revival next week. But if not, why don't we come today and say, God, I just need to spend some time and I need to beg you to help me and to set aside some of those things that cause me not to want to talk to folks that are different than I am. God help us with that. Father.